Hello, hello, hello. Hope everyone is doing great. And of course, I want to thank you all for giving me this awesome opportunity to share with you a vision of a world that embraces fitness for life. First up, what I want to do for you here is share with you some lyrics from one of my favorite songs that always inspires me. It's a song that achieved its greatest popularity in the mid-80s when recorded by legendary pop songstress, The Voice, Whitney Houston. May she rest in peace. Now, I want to get everybody involved in this presentation right off the bat. So if I can please get you all to repeat after me as I recite just a little bit of these lyrics to you. And I'm sure some of you may know the song, The Greatest Love of All. Please, repeat after me. I believe the children are the future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty that they possess inside. Man, that song just gets to me. Makes me want to do great things. Inspires me. Such a beautiful song. But I know what you're thinking. What does that have to do with fitness? Well, the song The Greatest Love of All, written in 1977 by Michael Massier and Linda Cree, and originally recorded by pop jazz great George Benson for the motion picture movie The Greatest, about heavyweight champion of the world, float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, Muhammad Ali. And let's see, I was 10, 11 years old when Muhammad Ali was promoting the importance of fitness for kids in an event sponsored at that time by the Chicago Park District. And basically it was come out, run a mile with Muhammad Ali in the name of fitness. And bless my mom, she took me and my big brother out to jog and meet the champ. Now, I want you to keep something in mind. Back then, the boxing heavyweight champion of the world was like the king of the world. So, me as a little boy having a chance to meet Muhammad Ali definitely had an effect on me. I remember his, his hands, his fists were so big. And certainly his message of the importance of fitness stayed with me throughout my life. Also, as a Masters Track and Field Championship, I have so many people come up to me, whether at work, at the gym, at track meets, asking me, how do you jump so far? You look so young. Why do you eat the way you do? So today, I try to answer some of those questions with the hope that my approach to fitness, training, and eating systems will help others improve their lives. Now, a footnote to the Ali story. A little over a decade after running with Muhammad Ali, actually it was me and 50 other kids, but you know, it felt like me and Ali. Anyway, 10 years after that, I was coaching youth track and field in Chicago. And there was this little girl, 11, 12 years old maybe, and she was, I don't know, how should I say this, kind of dainty, delicate, and definitely highly fashionable. She had this uh, Louis Vuitton purse uh, she would bring it to track to work out with. I remember I was teaching a long jump that day and I was thinking to myself, this child is much too fragile to be out here long jumping. It's not going to work. Let me tell you something. She put that purse down, got on that runway and hit that long jump pit like she was knocking somebody out. Like she flipped the switch and went from supermodel to athlete extraordinaire. And you guessed it. That was Muhammad Ali's little girl, Layla Ali, who grew up to be a boxing champion in her own right, model, actress. And today, it is I who looks up to her as a successful spokesperson for healthier living lifestyles. So I say to you again, teach them well and let them lead the way. Or in other words, it's about the awareness of the importance of fitness in this world and passing that awareness along to others, particularly our young, the future.
Okay. I like to know now with a show of hands, how many of you out there participated in some kind of sports when you were kids? And yeah, I know I can't really see you, but I feel like I'm right there with you. A good friend having a chat. How about I call out a few sports here? Baseball or softball? Soccer? A lot of kids play soccer nowadays. Basketball? Tennis? Anyone? Swimming? An excellent sport that will keep you fit all your life. So look, even if you never had a chance to participate in some kind of uh, organized sports when you were a kid, let me just say this to you. If you ever ran, jumped, or threw something at your little brother or sister when it made you mad, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. If you ever threw a ball or a frisbee, then you already have an idea about my chosen life sport, track and field. Now, what I do nowadays is called Masters Track and Field. By Masters, I mean competitive sporting events for people ranging from the age of 30 all the way up to 100, believe it or not. We compete in five-year age brackets, so I'm in the 45, 49 age group. But my point to you is this. I started long jumping into the sand pit when I was nine years old. And some 40 years later, I'm still long jumping into the sand pit. And the only difference is, is instead of tracking sand all up into my mama's house, I'm tracking it into my own place. I want to share with you a few of the things I love about Masters Track. For one, you can't go to one of these big Masters track events and not be inspired and motivated when you see 50, 60, 70 year olds pole vaulting, high jumping, hurtling, running like the wind. Makes you want to get up off your butt, put down the excuses, and do something for yourself fitness wise. Another thing that I love about Masters track events is that you'll have folks with all different kinds of backgrounds and reasons coming together to participate in these competitive events. You'll have some people who never tried track at all in their 40s, 50s, say, hey, you know what? Let me see what I can do with this. And then, you know, you'll have some people who used to run track back in high school or something like that. And they just want to see if they still can do it, if they still got it. Relive that fun and excitement they had back in the day. Then, you'll have what I like to call the explorers. People like myself seeking to push past those boundaries that try to define what we are physically capable of at a certain age. The U.S. record holders and world record holders that seek to boldly go where no one has gone before. Star Trek, Gene Brockberry. <laughs> Seriously though, for me personally, setting the world record in the long jump for my age group has really just been a continuation of what I learned as a boy about the importance of fitness in our lives. I uh, was up late one night watching uh, ESPN and they had this uh, worldwide competition of fitness or something like that. They had all these different events to see who could work out the best. And Don't get me wrong, they had some serious athletes there. Real fitness experts and all that. Very competitive stuff. But here's the thing that got me. Fifty, hundred thousand dollars, big bucks and prize money. And I'm thinking to myself, I didn't get no check for setting the world record. Would have been nice. You know, folks, I'm, I'm not mad. No, 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 no. I'm just saying. <laughs> really what I want to convey to you here, ladies and gentlemen. So I think it's okay to see working out as your own sporting competition from time to time. Have that competitive championship focus and commitment to winning at being your best fitness-wise. Sometimes you'll need that Olympic-like sacrificing to ward off some of life's daily distractions and temptations that can keep you from fulfilling the fitness goals you may have for yourself. I say, when you're out there doing your fitness thing, Go ahead, have your own Super Bowl, World Series, Olympics, your one shining moment. Because surely what everyday folks do fitness-wise, day after day and year after year, 
is more important than what the big time gladiators and entertainers of the sporting world do when it comes to making a statement about who or what we are fitness wise as a society, as a people. But here's the question I want to put to you, or maybe the question you should put to yourself. Why should fitness for life be important to you? To anyone? Why should it matter? Well, let's get the obvious out the way. Good health is certainly one key to having a happy life. Now, of course, being well physically is not always in our control, but surely being physically fit throughout our lives, like an apple a day, can help keep the doctor away. Again, though, why? Why should fitness for life matter to you? Good physical fitness increases energy, efficiency. An efficient body has more energy to direct towards problem solving and fulfillment of goals. Here's something else to keep in mind about your mind. The body and mind are very symbiotic, very interconnected to each other, working together, one hand washing the other hand. And we need our minds, our attitudes to achieve anything worthwhile in life. Let me ask you this. Why should your fitness matter to me, mine to you? Why should we care? My answer to this question, for me, not speaking for anyone else, is that I just simply want to live in a world where we as a people care about each other's fitness and well-being. Blood or no blood. This country or that country. This race or that race. Why not just the human race? In March of 2014, I had the opportunity to compete or more like participate in my first World Masters Track and Field Championship in Hungary, Budapest, the good old Team USA. Of course, it was an honor and privilege to do so. But it turned out to be a lemonade kind of experience, turning lemons into refreshing lemonade. I was favored to win in both the long jump and triple jump. Second day, first event, first jump, pulled my hamstring, didn't even get a jump off, no mark. Yes, disappointment, ladies and gentlemen, as I lay injured on the track. But you know what? I'm from the south side of Chicago, inner city, ghetto, hood. And I've got one week to spend in hungry, beautiful Budapest at the World's Masters Championship. Took it in, took it in, took it all in, had a great time. But there was one shining moment at that track meet that stood out from all the rest. And I promise I'll come right back to that. But right now, if I could please get you all to stand. Don't be shy. Stand right up. You don't have to move or anything. What I'd like to do now is give you a quick and easy lesson in triple jumping. It's a crazy kind of event, kind of like hopscotch on rocket fuel. Now, if you uh, have any injuries or medical problems or anything that will keep you from doing a little light hopping in place, then please go ahead and sit this one out. But for the rest of us, let's give it a try. I'm going to turn to the side so you can see here. Here we go. You put your right leg up and you hop up and down. You put your left leg up and you hop up and down. You put your arms back and you hop up and down. And that's how you do the triple jump. <laughs> Alright, let me show you again. It's Hop on one foot, step to the other, jump into the sand pit. Again, hop, step, jump, the triple jump. Give yourself a hand. Good job for trying, good job, good effort. And please, have a seat, get comfortable again. Now, when you're doing it for real, trust me, the triple jump is really hard on your body. 
And I really want you to keep that in mind as I share this Budapest moment with you now. So, I'm injured at the world meeting. But now, I'm like the ultimate fan. I got my program, peanuts, popcorn, whole nine yards. And get this, I'm watching the women's 80 and 95 year old triple jump competition. Let me tell you something. I'd be blessed to watch TV at 85, 95 years old. And these ladies are barreling down the runway, hop, step, jump into the sand pit, triple jumping. Couldn't believe it. I was in awe. And then there was that moment. 85 year old lady smashes the triple jump world record for her age group. Her hands go in the air and triumph like Ali. A uh, smile comes over her face with joy and pure achievement. And then a little nine, ten year old girl comes running out of the stands with the same light of joy and achievement on her face. Granddaughter, great granddaughter. And leaps into her arms, brought me to tears. An awareness of the importance of fitness and passing that awareness on to others, particularly our young, or as I'm calling it now, fitness forward. You see, in the movie Pay It Forward, beautiful movie. If you haven't seen it, Netflix, it, try to find a way to check this movie out. Starring Kevin Spacey, Helen Hunt, Haley Joel Osment, who plays a boy who comes up with a way to make the world better by doing three good deeds for three people in need, and then those people choose three other someones to help out, and so on and so on, and it's really big, really fast, helping to change the world. Hence, pay it forward. And this all comes about when Kevin Spacey's character, who's a school teacher, challenges his sixth grade class with an assignment to come up with an idea to change the world, make it better. And as he's presenting this project to the class, these kids start whining and complaining about how it's too big, it's too hard, it's this, it's that. Can't do it. And Kevin Spacey's character, school teacher, says to them, and I quote, How about possible? It's possible. The realm of possibility exists where? In each of you. So you can do it. You can surprise us. It is up to you. Gives me chills. Love that movie. Mm. So let us pass along the importance of fitness in our lives and awareness with the power to make a difference in the world. Before I get into this next section of my presentation, I have two disclaimers I want to put to you. First is simple. You should always check with a physician first before beginning any kind of exercise program. And also, adjust your program to your physical type and fitness level. Disclaimer number two is a two-parter. First part is, although I'm going to share a story with you about a young gentleman who loses a pretty good bit of weight in a nine-month span, I want to make it absolutely clear that I strongly believe that a great training program is not about who we are on the outside. Those great Olympic-like athletic achievements, results that last, achievements that stick to your soul like peanut butter without the jelly. Ladies and gentlemen, those kind of results and achievements come from a place that is not about how we look, but instead who we are on the inside. Part two of this segment number two is simple. If you were expecting to hear information about counting calories, this particular exercise to do, how you should do this or that, well, I'm sorry to say that's just not going to happen here today. 
Not that those kinds of things aren't important to a good fitness program. Lots of excellent information out there on things like that. Just not going to hear it from me today. What you will hear, though, is my ultimate secret to how an almost 50-year-old guy is long jumping, 21, 22, just under 23 feet. You'll hear that self-awareness is a must, but also the importance of being aware of what you're up against when you choose to take the Fitness for Life journey. Okay, diets, workouts, swing, oh my! <laughs> Try saying that fast three times. No, really, you guys say it fast three times with me. Diets, workouts, sweating, oh my! Diets, workouts, sweating, oh my! Diets, workouts, sweating, oh my! <laughs> yes, it's true, I enjoy Frank Baum's wonderful Wizard of Oz when I was young. Maybe a bit too much. I want to tell you something funny about me, a confession of sorts. I don't like to train. I like to win, therefore I train. And I know, I know, I need to work on my attitude. Self-improvement is a constant ongoing process throughout life. It never ends. You can always strive to be a better human being. Now, look, I'm telling you this about me because I want you to understand that I can really relate to those who aren't professional or world-class athletes, to those who find the exercising, the sweating, the work, and discipline to be a bit of a chore and, well, sometimes a bore. <laughs> the real thing about this, though, as I hinted to you in disclaimer number two, is that we don't live in a society that embraces fitness as a way of life. It's like from day one, we've been set up to fail when it comes to having healthy, fit lifestyles. I want you to think about that for a moment. According to the UN's International Labor Organization, Americans work more hours than any other industrial country. Think about that. It'd be nice to not have to play the juggling game all the time. The kids, the shopping, the job. More energy, more me time for self-improvement, fitness, or otherwise. Be aware of what you're up against when you choose fitness for life. We eat, we eat, we eat. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Somebody's getting paid. And you know the cheap, least expensive foods. We can buy more and more and more. But then again, the cheap things tend not to be the healthy things. See how that works? It's like we got to leap tall buildings just to afford to put something good in our bodies. The more health problems we have, the less healthy we live our lives. To change, to change, to change. Somebody's getting paid. This prescription, that surgery, more insurance, more insurance, more health insurance. Be aware of what you're up against. Boy, let me tell you, love that Xbox, those computer games. But we sit, we sit, we sit. When I was a boy, I worked the paper route to get the quarters, to run to the game room, to play the games. In other words, the wonders of technology has also unfortunately taken our already sedentary lives to a whole new level. Open your eyes to some of the hidden obstacles, barriers that are built into our society that can keep you from taking the Fitness for Life journey if you let it. Here's a bit of dialogue from the character Morpheus from one of my favorite movies, The Matrix. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television set. You feel it when you go to work. It is the world that has been poured over your eyes to blind you from the truth. That like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell, taste, or touch. 
a prison for your mind. Or in this case, your body as well. I remember in 1996 when I was training for the Olympic trials, didn't have any sponsors or anything, so I'm working at McDonald's, got the food free. So I'm eating burger fries day after day, day after day. And then I start to notice and practice that I'm just dragging along. I can feel the grease, the fried food just slowing me down. And yeah, I was getting the food for free, but you know, somehow I still paying for it. And then I recall this uh, saying or slogan I heard when I was a kid. You are what you eat. I'm thinking, I'm a Big Mac. To all be patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. I don't want to be a fast food sandwich. I'm a long jumper. <laughs> I'm also a bit hard-headed, as my mom would tell you. Sometimes in life, you have to learn things the hard way. So, soon after that, it was grilled chicken, salads, and a burger and fry every once in a while. When I was the uh, assistant track coach uh, in charge of jumps, long jump, high jump, triple jump, teaching that, at the University of Chicago, I was still in the process of trying to live out my Olympic dream. And so what I would do is train in the morning and coach in the afternoon. So in the morning, I'm training by myself, putting my workout in, running around and around the track, hitting it hard in the weight room, and, you know, around regular folks and students. Now, occasionally when you're in an environment like that, you have this high-level athlete trying to do something, I would have people come up to me, ask me questions, who I was, what I was doing, fitness tips or whatever. Well, one day there was this guy, Sean, a nice young man, waited till after I was done with my workout and everything. He just wanted to ask me a few questions, what I was doing, what I was training for, I'm telling him, training for the Olympics and all that. He asked me how... I got started in track and things. So I explained to him that my father, Teruro Flores Palacios, was an Olympic high jumper competing for Guatemala, and how he came to the United States to run for the great University of Chicago coach, Ted Hayden. And also how, when I was young and I grew up, Coach Hayden became a kind of role model for me uh, with this great love for people that I have and connecting that passion with the sport of track and field. Because you see, Coach Hayden believed that the sport of track and field could make better human beings, if done right. Which is why it was such an honor to have had the opportunity to coach at the university and pass on his vision of the sport to the young men and women I worked with. And I've always found it kind of funny in life how you seek to carve out your own way, yet sometimes things seem to just be planned. And you sort of got to kind of find a way to match who you are to that grand plan, so to speak. For example, it's like with me. In December 2012, I set my master's indoor long-term record at the University of Chicago and attract me honoring the late, great Ted Hayden, who just happened to be the person who sponsored my dad to come to America. When my father met my mother at a University of Chicago event, then had my brother, then me. You see, it's all a bit too coincidental, which is why I kind of understand when it is said that life is more about how you perceive it than what you experience in it. Meaning, for our purposes, having a sense of self-awareness is so important when trying to attain goals that you may have for your life. If you, the person you are, doesn't line up with the goals you have for yourself, let me tell you, life will slap your perception back into reality real quick. Some of you out there know what I'm talking about, including me. I've been slapped every which way with lose by life. Hard hit. That's me. That's what I'm talking about. So again, matching your perception of who you are with what you're trying to achieve in life. A sense of self-awareness, a must, or as they say in the movie, The Matrix, know thyself. Anyway, this guy, Sean, for the life of me, I can't remember his last name, goes on to ask me advice on my approach to fitness. 
because he's been planning to start a fitness program for himself. He was a uh, heavier type guy. I just wanted to pick my brain, get some good tips on what I thought about some kind of training program for him, me being coach and athlete and all that. So I began to talk, lay out a few points, ideas, things that I thought would be helpful to him. It was really a beautiful conversation that we had. So I didn't see him for a while. It was almost a year past when I ran into him again. And at first, I didn't recognize him. He looked completely different. I was thinking, is that that guy Sean I was talking to? He had lost a lot of weight. And he said, oh yeah, I lost 90 pounds in nine months. I was like, wow, what, what, what did you do? And he said, I just did what you told me. Come on now, you gotta be kidding me. Really? I had something to do with this transformation. Man, I need to start a business, call it PBD. Put the burger down tight. Please put it down, right now. Seriously folks, it wasn't about me. It was about him and his awareness of what I shared with him. His commitment, effort, focus. Work. You see, we truly are the captains of our lives. And now, here's what I told him. If I could please get you all to stand one more time, and I promise no hokey pokey hopping this time. Just want to keep that blood flowing, get that energy up. What we're going to do is just get our shake on, like right before I take a big jump. I'm just shake it out. Come on, get your shake on. Shake it silly. Shake it cool if you like. Just keep that energy going because I'm about to put it all together and bring it home right. Energy up. Everybody ready? All right, enough on the shaking. But if you would please remain standing and repeat after me. Less is more. Consistency is the key. Good habits equal good results. Food systems, not diets. And finally, train your mind and let the body follow. At least that's the idea anyway, because, you know, sometimes the body has a mind of its own. I'll fight with you. You can do this. No, I can't. Yes, you can. No, I can't. Yes, you can. No, I can't. <laughs> In other words, the body sometimes wins out. All right, good job. Please, everybody, clap it out. Good job, good effort. Please go ahead and have a seat. Get comfortable again. About to get right to it and finish it up strong. All right, less is more. One of the biggest mistakes I've noticed with most folks when starting a fitness program is too much too soon, too fast. You'll burn yourself out. Give your mind, your body, the time, the chance to create those good habits that will bring about good, lasting results. Don't be afraid to start off slow and build up to what you're trying to do. You know, it takes time to develop these systems, patterns that will allow you to smoothly bend into your everyday life routine. And that's what our fitness programs need to be, just a part of our everyday lifestyle. Like getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth. Hence, good habits equal good results. I usually tell my athletes it takes six weeks to change your body. Three weeks to get started, another three weeks to take it to the next level, and then after that you do another six weeks, and then another six weeks, and soon you'll create those habits, patterns, routines that are the key to the Fitness for Life journey. And what that is, is consistency. One of the main reasons for me as a Masters track and field athlete, I've been able to compete at such a high level over a long period of time. It's that ability to Focus on being consistent. So start off with the small approach, the small picture, baby steps, and eventually you will get to the big picture.
food systems or eating systems, not diets. Now, I must tell you guys, I do eat rather strangely, and I'm certainly not saying my system is for everyone. For me personally, it kind of reminds me of something I heard action movie star Dwayne Johnson, better known as wrestling superstar The Rock. I heard him say something of the sort that when he was a kid, his father told him that food was not for his taste buds, but the energy his body needed to do what it needed to do. And that's kind of how it is with me. See, during the weekdays, I really don't taste the food at all. I only taste it on like weekends, holidays, and like special occasions. And what I do is I pretty much just eat the same thing. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Set times, very few things, but an eating system. Except when I'm tasting, enjoying the food, weekends, holidays, and stuff like that. But my point to you is this. I don't really have to count calories or anything. I find a set system that works and just stick with it. Now, my problem with the word diet is that mentally it comes off a bit temporary and restraining. That word diet just doesn't seem to convey an everyday process of living your life like an eating system. And look, like I said, I know this is not for everyone, particularly if you're not training at a high level. But in general, I'm just saying, be aware of what you put in your body, what time, how much. Be conscious of that and find an eating system that will work for you as for maintaining the fitness lifestyle you would like to have for yourself. Train your mind and let the body follow. I want to come back to the young gentleman, Sean. And I think one of the reasons he was successful with what he was trying to do with uh, his fitness program had a lot to do with him understanding the foundation of my approach to training in a way or at a level that worked for him. You see, my why or passion, that which drives me to strive for greatness and whatever it is I do, comes from my love of people wanting to connect, inspire, to explore the best that we can be as humanity. And so, as it turned out, when I last spoke to this guy, Sean, it was years ago, he had just finished up his Ph.D. at the University of Chicago in philosophy and theology. And he was now traveling the world speaking as an expert on the nature of love in our society. This love, these feelings, these thoughts is what drives me past my distaste for training. And it's also why I believe that it is your mind, your Thoughts that must be the foundation of whatever it is you want to achieve, fitness or otherwise. Here's a quote from Great Britain's first and only woman prime minister, Margaret Thatcher. Watch your thoughts, for they become words. Watch your words, for they become actions. Watch your actions, for they become habits. Watch your habits, for they become character. Watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. What we think, we become. Once again, with a show of hands, and I still can't see you yet, but I still feel like I'm right there with you. I'd like to know how many of you have quit smoking or know someone who's quit smoking. Anyone? <laughs> Look, I'm only bringing this smoking thing up as a kind of analogy to the challenges we face in society in trying to live healthy and fit lifestyles. Bear with me now on this one. Okay, with the smoking, you got that nicotine to kick. Some people go cold turkey, others use the patch or chewing gum. On the other hand, some today say we Americans are addicted to food, supersize it, run to the border, have it your way. I'm loving it. <laughs> I know this guy who uh, quit smoking. He told me he didn't really realize how much money his pack 
pack a day was costing him till he had all this extra cash to spend on other worthwhile things once he quit. Well, that's kind of like the windfall of extra energy you'll have for friends, family, careers, and dreams that come with choosing fitness for life. They tell me it's hard to quit smoking, changing bad habits to healthy habits, letting go of ways that you knew was not good for your long-term health prognosis. Well, same can be said for the societal challenges we face to maintain throughout our lives healthy and fit habits. Heard it said that the best way to quit smoking is to never start in the first place. It is in the spirit of this statement wherein lies my ultimate secret to how I'm still long and triple jumping at such a high level. Wait for it. I never stopped training. Never totally got out of long jump shape in my 20s, 30s, 40s, just around the corner, 50, about a year away. Maintained a high level of fitness for my entire life. Here's something that I find a bit funny when I meet people nowadays and tell them that I'm 49 years old and they look at me with this shocked look like I found the fountain of youth or something. Let me tell you, I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, if I had my speaking fee be so high, even Oprah Winfrey be calling a brother up looking for a loan. And well, that's just not happening. Certainly, though, uh, genetics, and I'm sure running master's track, has a lot to do with what you see with me. But even still, that's more of the effect and not the cause. Meaning, yes, staying in great track shape has probably helped maintain my younger appearance. But my reason for running comes from a youthful desire or curiosity just to see how far I can jump. Regardless of what age I am. I call this the power of a youthful spirit. Here's a quote on aging in the universe from someone a bit more intellectual than I. This is from Albert Einstein. People like you and I, though mortal of course, like everyone else, don't grow old, no matter how long we live. What I mean is that we never cease to stand like curious children, into which the mystery we were born. In August of 2007, Randy Posh, a professor of human computer interaction and design at Carnegie Mellon, was given a terminal diagnosis and told he had three to six months of good health left. A month later, he gave an upbeat lecture titled, Really Achieving Your Childhood Dreams. This last lecture, as it is commonly called, went viral on YouTube. Next, a best-selling book and a spot on Oprah before he passed away of pancreatic cancer on July 8, 2008. Now, there was a section in his lecture he called the head fake, which had to do with indirect learning. And when I say head fake, it's like when you're a kid playing tag or football, you fake one way and you go another way, shake them up, cross them over in basketball. Anyhow, the point being, it's like when I coach. So much of what you're teaching is not just about track or sports itself. Life lessons are being indirectly passed along, be it through discipline, focus, character even. And this is what Coach Ted Hayden meant by track helping to make better human beings. Now, I don't know if you guys caught it, but I had two head fakes in this presentation. The first is that I really do hope many of you, if not all, seek out the song, The Greatest Love of All. May it inspire and empower you like it has me. Also, seek out the movie Pay It Forward and just pay it forward, fitness or otherwise. And please, everyone, YouTube the last lecture. I certainly wouldn't be giving this speech to you now had I not experienced this 
wonderful legacy that Professor Randy Posh has left for us. Hefei 2 is that this presentation, Fitness for Life, was written for the children. Ladies and gentlemen, I wrote this for our future. And I'm asking each of you out there to help me fight all that these young people are up against today when it comes to being aware of the importance of fitness for life. And yes, I know, whatever it is we can do is probably not going to be as glamorous as the heavyweight champion of the world just simply taking a job with a 10-year-old boy and having an effect on his life forever. Yet, collectively, together, we can make a difference. Whether by example with our own fitness programs and a change in our own awareness of the importance of fitness, or just by encouraging a young one to exercise, get them to see that you are what you eat, the importance of healthy eating habits and choices. We can make a difference. I don't know how I know, I just know. I can feel it. And I'm telling you, we can make a difference. It is possible. We can be a society that values its fitness over its taste buds, its health over its profits. We can be a world that cares about each other's health and well-being. This is what I believe. It's what I work for. And yes, I'm not ashamed to say, it's what I love for. It's what I like each of you out there to pass on to the children. This love, this greatness. Thank you all so very much and stay fit for life. I'm Antonio Chris Palacios and as always, a better you, a better world, a call to action. God bless. Goodbye now.